In Mark chapter 11, verse number 8, it records the triumphal entry or Palm Sunday, what happens on that given day, as though it were this day. Listen to what it says. Mark chapter 11, verse 8. And many spread their garments in the road, and others spread leafy branches which they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed after were crying out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. And he entered Jerusalem and came into the temple. And after looking all around, he departed for Bethany with the twelve, since it was already late. This is the experience of Jesus entering in Jerusalem on that Sunday, Palm Sunday, he enters in and he has a triumphal entry. All the people are laying their cloaks out, they're laying palm branches out, and they're singing praise to Jesus, some of the most pure praise that he would experience while he walked here on this earth. Hosanna, Hosanna to God in the highest. And Jesus riding in on that young donkey, and everybody praising and adoring this one, the Messiah. This one, the great teacher, this one, the healer, this one, the miracle worker. And they're praising and adoring him. Don't you know that, that in Jesus' experience here on this earth, don't you know that that was one of the high water marks? Don't you know that that blessed him, that people were honoring him and praising him and crying out to him, Hosanna. That was on Sunday. Hold your hand there. Turn your Bibles there to Mark 15, chapter 8. Just a few chapters in the Bible, just a few days in a week. Matter of fact, this is from the events that happened on Sunday to the events that are happening on Friday, Thursday night and Friday. At this point in the story, he's been brought before Pontius Pilate. As he's brought before Pontius Pilate, Pilate would really like to let him go. And this is what happens, verse 8. And the multitude went up and began asking him, Pilate, to do as he had been accustomed to do for them. And Pilate answered them, saying, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he was aware that the chief priest had delivered him up because of envy. But the chief priest stirred up the multitude to ask him to release Barabbas for them instead. Wow. Verse 12, and answering again, Pilate was saying to them, Then what shall I do to him whom you call the king of the Jews? Talking about Jesus. And they shouted back, Crucify him. But Pilate was saying to them, Why, what evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him. And wishing to satisfy the multitude, Pilate released Barabbas for them, and after having Jesus scourged, he delivered him over to be crucified. Think about that. On a Sunday, there's the triumphal entry, and they're praising Jesus. And by Friday, they're crying out, crucify him. They're choosing him to be crucified rather than Barabbas, an old thief and murderer. They're calling out for the Son of God, the King of the Jews. They're calling out, crucify him. Pilate thought, well, if I scourge him, be enough. No, they wanted him scourged, and then they wanted him crucified. What do I do with him? I crucify him. Crucify him. Now, I hope you realize something. That's the same group of people. <laughs> same city. Same time frame. It's just a few days from Sunday to Friday. Sunday praising him. Hosanna. Friday crying out for him to be crucified. Now if you were to put a title on this message, it would be, What a Difference a Week Makes. What a difference a week makes. How could that possibly be that in that short a period of time, they've gone from praising him to seeking to crucify him. Well, we know that under this whole thing is old Satan, don't we? 
We know that old Satan doesn't like Jesus, the Son of God, and Satan was trying to make him sin, and when he couldn't make him sin, he knew he had to get rid of him. And Satan is working diligently to try to find this plan. And we know that Satan is behind the scene. We also know that God ultimately has a plan, that he knew that his son was going to have to die on a cross. So we understand that God is God of all, and Satan is here working. But I want you to understand something else, and that is that these people are still responsible for their actions. People are still responsible for their actions. And there's something that had to happen in their lives, something that caused them to change from praising him to seeking and wanting him to be crucified. What took place? Well, that's recorded here in Mark's gospel from chapter 11 through chapter 15. It's recorded what happens at that time. Go back to Mark 11. I want to show you something. I don't know if you underlined it the first time, but I have you underline it now. In verse number 11 of Mark 11, it says this, And Jesus entered Jerusalem and came into the temple, and after looking around, he departed for Bethany. You ought to underline that. He came into the temple, and he looked around. He came into the temple, and he looked around. See, when Jesus came in, he began to look around. And when he began to look around, he began to realize there were things that needed to happen and things that needed to change. There were truths that needed to be taught and people that needed to be confronted about their life. And, and what you find in between that Sunday and the events that happened on Friday, you find that Jesus has walked around the temple and he's walked around in their lives and he begins to confront them about issues in their life. He begins to talk to them and he begins to teach them about things in their lives that need to be corrected, things that need to be made right. Now the reason that they really praised him when he came in on that Sunday was because he was a miracle worker. Did you know that? They knew that he was the one who healed the blind, he had helped the lame to walk, he had fed 5,000 with a few fish and loaves. And really the real reason they were praising him, if you take John's account in John chapter 12, he gives you the real reason that they're gathered, they're praising him, it's because he raised Lazarus from the dead. I mean, man, if this guy is a miracle worker and he's one that can take dead people and bring them to life... He needs to be praised. We need to honor him. We need to glorify him. We need to have a relationship with this miracle worker. And Jesus is a miracle worker, and Jesus is one who raises people from the dead. But that's not all that Jesus does. Jesus comes to be involved in my life and your life, and he comes to make changes in my life and your life, and he came to make a difference in my life and your life. And just, listen, just as he comes into that temple in Jerusalem, and he looks around and sees what needs to happen, and all this next week, that week he's going to be confronting them about issues of their life, that's exactly what Jesus does for you. Do you understand that? Jesus came into your heart and your life to confront you about your life. He comes in to do a work in your life. He comes in to perfect you and to make you more like Jesus. And as Jesus walks with you, I hope you don't just see him as a miracle worker. And I hope you just don't see him as the one who died on the cross. I hope you understand that he's Lord of your life and that he's involved in your life. And he's going to confront you in your life. Each and every day, he confronts me. What about you? Does he talk to you about your life? I'll assure you that he talks to you about your life. If he doesn't talk to you about your life, there are just a few reasons why. And I don't think any of those are actually happening in your life. One thing, if Jesus doesn't confront you about things in your life, you're perfect. You're perfect. I don't think I see any of you that are perfect. All right? The second reason that Jesus wouldn't confront you about anything in your life is because he's not involved in your life. He's not there. Because when he is there, he's going to confront. He's going to deal with those issues. Or the third thing, that Jesus is there, and you've got so much junk going on in your life, you can't even hear him when he confronts you. I mean, if I had time, I'd like to have a testimony right now this week of tell me what Jesus confronted you about in your life this week. And if you couldn't give me that testimony, then one of those three things is true in your life. You either either get saved, you're perfect, I'm not worried about that one, or either you don't hear him because he's going to confront you because he loves you. 
Because he wants you to be what he wants you to be. And he's going to work in your life all the time. I, I can't remember a day in my life that he hasn't worked in my life. There have been some times I haven't heard it, but I'm telling you, I can give you a whole list of this week what he's worked in my life about. He confronts on every side. He's going to confront you just like he confronted them. But here's the key. When he confronts us, what happens? This is the danger. When he confronts them, instead of them receiving what he says and being changed, they get offended. They get offended. You need to write that down. Whenever, whenever Jesus confronts you, you're either going to say yes, Lord, to him and, and believe him and change your life, or you're going to get offended that he even told you that. And one of the dangers of your life and my life is that we can get offended at what Jesus says. Well, he begins to confront them and they get offended. One by one, different groups get offended. Let me share with you. We'll just walk through and you can read it uh, when you get home. Let me share with you how he begins to confront them. First thing he confronts, beginning in Mark chapter 11, verse 15, he confronts them about their worship. The first day he comes in, he looks around the temple, he goes to Bethany, he turns around the next day, he comes back and he immediately goes in the temple. You remember what Jesus did when he came into the temple? He took a whip and he turned over the money changers' tables and he ran them out and he said, this is my father's house that is supposed to be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. He confronts them in the area of worship. In the area of worship, a place of worship, the attitude of worship, what they're supposed to be doing in worship, and in regard to that worship, he tells them you're doing wrong, he confronts them about the error of their way, and in that, some of them are going to get offended. They're going to get offended. Well, I'm going to tell you, Jesus will confront you about your worship too. <laughs> it's amazing to me how worship can divide churches, did you know that? I mean, if we just talk about worship in regard to preference of music, churches are divided everywhere about preference of music. Somebody said, well, that's not what God wants in music, and this is what I like in music, and that's what they like in music, and I can't get anything out of that music and this kind of thing. Let me tell you, first of all, about worship. You need to write this down. Worship's not about you anyway. It's not about you. It's not about you liking it, you enjoying it. It's what you, makes you feel good. Worship is not about you. Worship's about God. Worship's about Jesus. And let me fill you in on something. He told me this, all right? Listen carefully. He told me he likes it all. He does. He likes it all. Any worship that honors him, pleases him, exalts him, he likes it all. He's the creator of music. But people will get offended about, about worship. They'll get offended not only about music, about somebody raising their hands, sitting down, not sitting down, standing up. None of those things. are. There is no standard. We think there's a standard. Do you know what your standard of worship is? Let me help you. Your standard of worship is you. What you are. You're your standard. And if you're the standard, then there's always people to your left who are far looser, or there are always people to your right who are far more strict or stringent. You're the standard. You're not the standard. Jesus is the standard. Do you understand that? But when Jesus comes on the scene and he goes in there and he turns over the money changers and he tables and he runs them out of the temple and he deals with the issues of their life, they get offended. Just like other people get offended. When worship's not the way they like it. Second thing that he deals with. He deals with authority. Beginning in verse 27. About authority. They come and they ask Jesus. By what authority are you doing these things? Jesus is such a wise teacher. Did you, you know what he said? She said, I'll answer your question if you'll tell me this. By what authority, are, by what authority did, did John come? John the Baptist. Well, they, they, they begin to think, the Pharisees begin to think, so, well, if we say that he was of God, then Jesus is going to say, well, why didn't you follow him? And if we say he's of man, then the people who think he's a prophet, they're going to get mad. And they said, uh, we don't know. He said, well, I'm not going to tell you either. 
But he did go and tell them a parable, and he told them a parable about the vineyard, you remember? The man who made the vineyard, and he rented it out to some people, and they were supposed to give him back some of the produce and some of the money, and he sent slaves, and they killed those slaves and mistreated them. And finally, ultimately, they sent, he sent his son, and they killed him too. And that's a parable about what they did and how they responded to him, the Son of God, Jesus, when God the Father sent him to the earth. He was dealing with them about this issue that they did not respect God's authority and they did not submit to the lordship of Jesus. Did not submit to the lordship of Jesus, did not recognize the lordship of Jesus. I'll tell you another area that God's going to confront you. The Holy Spirit's going to confront you in worship, but he's also going to confront you about the lordship of Jesus. Is he lord of your life? Is he boss of your life? Are you submissive to his leadership? Do you say yes, Lord, to him? If you rebel against his lordship, I'm here to tell you, Jesus is going to come and he's going to confront you. He's going to confront you over and over again about the fact of Jesus being Lord of your life. He didn't come in and just be Savior of your life. He came to be Lord of your life. And he wants you and me to submit to his lordship, to his leadership. That you do what he says rather than him fitting into your plan. He confronts them in lordship, and you know what? They don't like it. Some of them don't like what he says. They don't like his answer. They don't like the fact that he wants to be Lord over their life. And they get offended. Well, the next